I'm Dennis Charney. I'm Dean of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Convocation is always a very special event. Uh, so we're going to do a couple things today. Uh, first, uh, our president and CEO, Ken Davis, is going to make remarks that uh, are very pertinent and uh, timely. Uh, then I'm going to give the state of the school, which will include uh, our strategic plan that we developed over the last uh, year plus. And then we're going to start probably what all of you have been waiting for, and that is awarding our endowed chairs, where we have a spectacular group and large group, which I think speaks well for what's happening at Mount Sinai, of endowed chair recipients. So let's get started, and I'd like to introduce my very close friend, my best friend, uh, Ken Davis, who has uh, made Mount Sinai great with his leadership. Ken. And to prove how close our friendship is Saturday night, we're going to be watching, listening to a Bruce Springsteen concerts in my house on DVD. We couldn't get tickets to his show. Anyway. All right. Oh, I don't have any slides here. Whoa, 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 whoa. So now you're seeing the whole presentation, and it's not stopping. Should we stop here? Okay. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Convocation. It is a special event that marks the beginning of the academic year for, the, for our medical school. The beginning of the school year usually is a time of great excitement and anticipation, but this year is different. For many at Mount Sinai and across the country, the start of this school year is darkened by the recent termination of the DACA program. This announcement is deeply troubling, not only for the Mount Sinai students and employees who are part of the DACA program and whose future is now in limbo, but also for all of us who care about their fate and the contributions they make to our community. As you know, these individuals were brought to the United States as children. And in many cases, this is the only country that they know. This is the country where many took their first steps, first learned the difference later in life between DNA and RNA, the country where many met their partners in life and created a home for themselves and their families. This is the country and this is the school where they're living out their dreams. Mount Sinai is proud to be part of that dream, and even in these unsettling times, we intend to do what we can to protect their rights and the opportunities that our country has to offer. In addition to this assault on our core value of inclusion, we have other serious public policy concerns before us that I want to address today. As we meet, Congress is debating the federal budget for the next fiscal year. Issues such as building a wall with Mexico, enhancing the defense budget, rebuilding the, def the nuclear arsenal, and cutting corporate taxes in addition to the DACA problems are dominating the conversation. Underlying all those discussions is how to pay for expensive new spending at the same time taxes are to be reduced. The executive branch weighed in with their budget proposal earlier in the year of real concern for all the people in this room, and particularly for the recipients on my right, who will be bestowed with endowed chairs today, was the proposed cut in the NIH budget of approximately 22%, 22%. That cut was unprecedented. Many of us were relieved when a bipartisan group of senators and congressmen said the cut was dead on arrival. And instead, the House proposed a 3% increase. And some of us rejoiced. Today, I want to argue that rejoicing was a mistake and that to accept this negligible increase is a pyrrhic victory at best and at worst, an enormous opportunity lost. Today, we're in the threshold of a new frontier that can redefine what is possible from medicine. We've made tremendous advances in genomics and cellular biology and imaging and brain mapping to name just a few. These are breakthroughs that have delivered tools that are changing the face of medicine, tools that allow us to save and improve lives, and tools that can even reduce healthcare costs. Yet, at this time of unprecedented opportunity, we find ourselves defending the budgetary status quo. 
we find ourselves in the untenable situation of accepting any small increase as a victory. That's a threat to science, it's a threat to our life's work, it's a threat to the advancement of medicine, and I would argue it's a threat to the future of humanity and what is possible. We have the potential to oversee a revolution in biology in our lifetimes that is equivalent to the revolution in, bi in physics that experienced the last generation. The revolution that allowed me to take out this phone, take a picture of my friends in the first row, and send it to China in milliseconds. We are living through that same revolution in biology. The general public, though, is under the impression that Big Pharma is responsible for new drug discoveries. They've lost sight of the importance of academic research. It's at centers like ours where the mysteries of disease are unraveled. Those are the discoveries that make new medicines possible. For example, in just the last few months, researchers in our medical school have made discoveries that will advance the treatment of leukemia, deliver a new gene therapy for pulmonary hypertension, and bring a better understanding of how Alzheimer's disease develops. But with these opportunities comes responsibility. With the stature of an endowed chair comes responsibility to stand up and let the world know what significant work goes on in your laboratories. We have no reason to be defensive about the need for funding. In fact, this is the time of historic opportunity, a time for us to be bold. Instead of defending the status quo, I would argue we should advocate for doubling the NIH budget. I mean that, doubling the budget. Indeed, under Presidents Clinton and Bush, we had experienced a doubling of the NIH budget. That funding made it possible to sequence the human genome, a breakthrough that we see has enormous consequences for the work we're doing today. Today, a doubling of the NIH budget would inevitably bring forth new therapies that would affect the lives of millions of people. We have the possibility together to achieve great things. We're at a time, I believe, in science that's comparable to the beginning of the Renaissance, when sciences and the arts changed the course of humanity in the 14th and 15th century and unleashed an era of incredible creativity. Today, we have that same opportunity with science to change the world. I hope that one day our grandchildren will wonder why cancer was such a scourge, will wonder why we all didn't celebrate our centennial birthdays, will wonder what was Alzheimer's disease. Our time is now but only if we raise our voices about the opportunity that is before us and make those voices heard in Washington. Thank you. Now, before, before I hand over the stage to Dennis, who I believe is the greatest dean in the country today, as well as the greatest Springsteen fan, I wanted to take a moment to thank our dedicated philanthropists who've made these chairs possible, many who are with us today and are celebrating tonight. Dr. Adam Bender, Susan Coleman, Lucy and Mike Danziger, Ivan and Francisca Berkowitz on behalf of the Kest family, and Dr. Norman Orentreich and his family. Additionally, I want to thank Ellen and Howard Katz, the Aaron family, and the late Dr. Henry M. Stratton and his wife Lillian. We thank you for all the support you've provided to our faculty and to our school, your belief in us, and your commitment to excellence in research, science, and education. Now let's give them a round of applause because they really deserve it. <laughs> uh, I unfortunately have been called away, so I regret that I'm going to miss the rest of this terrific ceremony, but I really have to go. Um, but my congratulations to the endowed professors. Thank you, Ken. That's a very important charge uh, for all of us. So I'm going to start with uh, talking about the state of the school and then talk about our strategic plan uh, that is the basis of a capital campaign uh, over the next five to seven years. The state of the school is strong, and I hope that I can prove that with some of the data that I'm going to show you today. So what are, what are the, sum of the numbers? And these are numbers that deans uh, care about, but I think they reflect uh, the strength of our school. Uh, this is data from 2016 uh, related to our research accomplishments. 
Uh, we are number two in research dollars per principal investigator in the country. So it means that the quality of our science that is competitive against the other top scientists is as good as any place in the United States. Um, we are number three in research dollars per square foot. Uh, and I'll talk about this later on. It means that we need more space, and that's part of our strategic <laughs> plan. <laughs> research quality. This is a uh, metric that just came out in the last several weeks from the journal Nature. Uh, Nature is probably the top scientific journal uh, in the world, and they came out with a new ranking uh, system of all research institutions in the world. And they call it the Nature Innovation Index. And what it reflects is the publications that come out of a institution that lead to new patents and ultimately to new drugs and devices. So it, it really captures the innovation in a given institution. And we didn't know anything about this uh, ranking system, and all of a sudden it came out. And uh, we're pleased because we rank number 10 in the world among all institutions in the Nature Innovation Index. So it means not only are our scientists very competitive for getting NIH grants as reflected in what I just showed you before, but that science is leading to new products, new drugs that change the course of medical disease. And that's what Mount Sinai is all about. We're not just about getting grants and publishing in top journals. We're about changing the lives of our patients. Our faculty has grown dramatically over the last several years because of the acquisition of the former continuum system. Uh, we have gone from around 2,000 uh, faculty to over 3,400. And that integration has worked very well, in large part because uh, we welcomed the new faculty. All of our chairs have done a spectacular job in welcoming the new faculty that now are fully integrated into the Mount Sinai health system. We've had a number of new appointments this uh, past year that are very important. Uh, Stephen Borokov has been named Dean for Cancer Innovation after doing a spectacular job in leading the Tisch Cancer Institute. Stephen's here someplace. Steve, if you can stand up. Uh, you've done just a spectacular job <laughs> in leading the Tisch Cancer Institute. However, this is not a retirement position. Uh, this is a, a very important leadership position uh, to lead us in the future in, in further advancing our cancer research to make a difference for our, our patients. Uh, Mike Lightman, who uh, has been named Dean for Graduate Medical Education. Uh, Eric Schatt has been named Dean for Precision Medicine. We have recruited two new system chairs, uh, Eric Barton for Emergency Medicine and Sean Morrison, who's going to, uh, getting an endowed chair uh, today in geriatrics. And as part of our strategic plan, uh, we've opened up, established a number of new uh, research institutes, and you can see there uh, some of those institutes and the new directors that have been named. Because of the growth in the uh, medical school, we're now one of the largest medical schools in the country in terms of number of faculty, number of uh, research grants. Uh, I have named a number of new senior associate deans to uh, impo important, uh, this has essentially been promotions uh, to important new positions throughout uh, the school. How are we doing in recruiting uh, medical students? Uh, our medical students are uh, among the best in the world. Uh, most of us who are faculty say we couldn't get into Mount Sinai uh, right now because of the quality of our students and the, the competitiveness of getting into our school. Uh, so this is the matriculating uh, class that arrived in 2017. Uh, you can see that their median GPA is 3.83. Uh, they come from the top schools in the country, and on top of that, they are passionate uh, about becoming leaders, whether it's in research, advocacy, um, clinical physicians, et cetera. They're, uh, they're the best. And I, I want to mention what a great job our medical education department has done. Uh, th this is the, 
entering class of the MD PhD students, also terrific, are going to become great scientists. The average GPA is 3.9. Those of you who haven't been in school for a while, the best you can get is 4.0. <laughs> In the past year, our Department of Medical Education has done uh, many notable things. I'm not going to read all these slides. They're going to be on uh, our website in a few days. So uh, for those of you who want to focus on the details, they'll, they'll be there. Uh, I, I want to note that the FlexMed program, where we enter about one-third of our school, uh, our students, after an early acceptance, has worked out very well. These, these students. All our students are spectacular. Uh, these students uh, bring in students that can focus on a variety of different areas and not be bound by the traditional pre-med requirements. So uh, these students can be um, humanities students majoring in music or computer scientists or physician, uh, physicists, et cetera, but they all share a passion be to become uh, physicians and physician uh, scientists. We've uh, fully uh, integrated a new curriculum. Uh, we've expanded our faculty advisory group. We're now preparing for the next LCME reaccreditation uh, process. No worries there, though. Uh, we have focused in the past year and will be implementing a new program that we call ICON uh, Be Well. Uh, you may be aware that there's a lot more information coming out about the stress and burnout among health professional uh, health professions in general, that includes the full spectrum of those involved in delivering health care, includes medical students, house staff, faculty. And so we, we're paying over the next, we'll be paying over the next several years, particularly uh, att attending to wellness, providing resources for our students, for our house staff. Uh, to help them achieve a balance in their life so that they achieve the best in their profession, but they're also achieving the best in their personal life. And the school will be made, making substantial investments in that area. As I mentioned, we promoted uh, Mike Leitman to, to be a full dean. Where, where's Mike? Um, Mike, if you could stand up. Uh, Mike has done a fantastic job. And on top of that, he's leading the largest GME program in the United States. Uh, so this is uh, recent data that lists the number of residents associated with different uh, health systems. And you can see there uh, we're number one uh, in terms of the number of residents. We are now responsible for training 2,193 residents. That's Mike's responsibility. He's done great. And you can see number two is New York Presbyterian, but there are 400 residents behind us. So. Uh, we have great responsibility to train the next generation of leaders in medicine. Our residency programs are, are doing well. Uh, we have many ranked in the top 25. Uh, this ranking system, in my opinion, is flawed. It's based on uh, rankings using uh, US News and World criteria, which I think are very much flawed. Uh, they're also using doximity to to get the rankings, but we, we have to play that game. So I think these rankings under represent the quality of our training programs, and we're working very hard to uh, get the word out through Doximity, which now has about 75% of all physicians are on Doximity. It's like a Facebook site uh, for uh, physicians, and so we need to take advantage of that in how we uh, get the word about the quality of our training uh, programs. And that, that includes the goals uh, listed here for next year. Our PhD program has done spectacularly well. Uh, we, this is the class that we've admitted for the coming year. It has the highest metrics of any class that we have admitted. And uh, on top of that, the students come from top schools, have already published uh, top papers already. So we're very excited about this uh, group coming in, and they, they come from many different undergraduate schools. We are growing our master's programs. Uh, many of the master's programs are a terminal degree, uh, 
and others are a gateway to other degrees like PhD degrees and MD degrees. Uh, and so this is a very important initiative for the school. It's become more important over the last several years and the quality of these programs has been improving. The graduate school has worked very hard in expanding its reach. Uh, and it includes establishing exchange programs, affiliations uh, with other schools to provide our students uh, courses that may not be easily available on our own campus. And that includes collaborations, affiliations with CUNY, which has a very strong uh, engineering school, uh, enhancing our biostatistical training programs, creating new uh, training tracks like translational oncology, and so on and so forth. This details some of the expanded affiliations that we've made in the past year, a graduate student exchange program with CUNY, uh, closely affiliating with the Grove School of Engineering at CUNY. Our affiliation with the Rensselaer Polytech has matured. We now have over $14 million in uh, joint funding. And we've established a, a, an affiliation over the last year or so with Stony Brook, where they have very strong programs in computer science and engineering and physics. And we, uh, frankly, are much stronger in the biomedical uh, scientists, so it's a very good collaboration so far, and we expect it to expand over the next several years. And we are about to establish a new affiliation. Uh, ben, I think I saw you come in. Ben Tenover, if you could stand up. Uh, ben is a, uh, helped establish, about to establish a new uh, affiliation with Institute Pasteur, which is uh, one of the top institutions as it relates to research in virology as we are, and so we think this is going to be a very strong uh, partnership over the next several years. We've uh, done some renovation over the past years, uh, the past year. Uh, new classrooms. Uh, we converted the room formerly known as the boardroom uh, on the fifth floor in Annenberg to what we have now named as Center for Innovation and Discovery, a very flexible space, uh, allows uh, our students to write on the, the white walls and um, to think uh, great thoughts. And as, as so we're very pleased with that, and we've added to the classroom space. We've enhanced the Patricia and Robert Levinson uh, Student Center. It's actually, student Center, it's actually remarkable what uh, our architects and facilities uh, uh, folks have done. Uh, it just recently completed, so it's, it's part of the Mount I can be well program to enhance the kind of recreational space uh, that we need for our students. We're placing a lot more attention in connecting with our alumni. We have about 30,000 alumni now across the medical school, the, the uh, training programs, the hospital training programs, and so forth. Given that our school started in the uh, late 1960s, essentially we have as many living alumni as any other medical school and graduate school. So this year we are reaching out to all of our alumni to inform them of all the great things uh, that are happening and, uh, and maybe in a year or two we'll ask them to help support the uh, capital campaign. Mentoring is very important at the school and under the leadership of Elizabeth Howell and Lakshmi Devi, Dean and Associate Dean, uh, to reach out to our junior faculty to make sure we're providing the kind of mentoring that they need to be successful uh, going forward. Diversity, a very important priority for our school and our medical school. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the things that we're doing, but I think it's reflected that the Mount Sinai Health System, including the school, was ranked number one in the United States by Diversity, Inc in 2017. So it's, it's uh, we're never going to be satisfied, but I, it's a high priority for us to support diversity in all its aspects. So here's some more numbers. This is the numbers that uh, illustrate where we are in our research. Uh, expenditures per principal investigator. Uh, this is uh, anonymized data, but we're, no, we're number 271 
over there on the left where we rank number two in the United States, number three in research dollars per square foot. And in terms of um, the growth of our sponsored programs, research programs from all sources, uh, we are number four in the United States. So you can see we are among the very top medical schools in the country when it comes to our research. As I mentioned before, it's not just about getting the research dollars and publishing in top journals. It's about converting that science to products, new drugs, new devices. And so we have invested very heavily in our tech transfer office, which we call Mount Sinai Innovation uh, Partners. And, and this is uh, the data over the last several years. And you can, you can see that uh, new patents filed uh, and a variety of other metrics of where our science is headed are, are illustrative that our science is headed toward commercialization and our tech transfer office, Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, is providing the infrastructure for that to happen. We've done a couple of things to facilitate, and the one I want to highlight most is that we, uh, the school has begun to fund an accelerator, uh, beginning with a $10 million investment over the next several years, and that is to identify Mount Sinai science that needs further uh, financial investment so that the science is ready for commercialization with an industry uh, partner. The number of startups has increased uh, dramatically and as well as alliance with other, uh, other companies. Perhaps the most dramatic example of that is the formation of a Mount Sinai-owned company, not a startup, uh, a very mature company called Semaphore which we launched on June 1st, 2017, whose mission is none other than to revolutionize clinical diagnostics and create a big data information system that will enable us to identify how to uh, identify ways to prevent and better treat human disease. So already we have approximately 350 employees. Some have joined uh, faculty appointments, other are, are fully with the, uh, the company. We're very excited that uh, this company will soon become a leader in its field in genomic testing and big information science. Eric Schatt, who's been our chair of genetics and is now dean for precision medicine, is Semaphore's uh, CEO. The faculty practice under the leadership of Bert Dreyer uh, has continued to grow. Uh, the operating margin is strong, as is the contribution uh, margin. We have worked very hard to improve our infrastructure to serve our doctors in terms of our billing office, our access uh, uh, facilities, and so forth. You might notice here that the growth is different uh, between 16 and 17. That's because the genomic uh, sequencing work, which is semaphore, and was over $100 million moved into the new company. So apples to apples, the uh, faculty practice is continuing to grow. They want Bert to be uh, misled by that. Here's an amazing number in terms of our access uh, uh, center. This is to provide an infrastructure so that our patients can call, get an appointment, essentially you know, right away, uh, or have their questions answered right away. The uh, Access Center now takes 250,000 calls a month, like 3 million calls a year. Several years ago, what was it, Bert? I mean, it was hardly anything. So we, we've gone from a standing start to 3 million calls uh, a year, and it's, it's through the uh, very hard work of Bert Dreyer and his team. Maybe, Bert, you can stand up and be acknowledged because he's done a fantastic job as the CEO of the faculty practice. And here are, here are numbers that show, you know, the growth over the last several years in terms of ambulatory encounters, outpatient visits, and what our uh, ongoing initiatives are. You know, over the, over the coming year, 
uh, we're going to focus very heavily on growing our faculty practice throughout the health system, in, including uh, Mount Sinai, St. Luke's, and I know Art Gianelli is here, the president, has done a great job. Uh, we're going to be renovating uh, a space at, at uh, Mount Sinai, St. Luke's to grow the faculty practice, and, and here are some of the things that uh, we are doing and will be doing over the next year, uh, renovating an ambulatory pavilion, which will be as nice as anything we have uh, throughout the, the system, having new imaging center, uh, and so on and so forth. So Mount Sinai St. Luke's is going to be uh, a, a totally new place. It's only a mile from this campus, so it's one Mount Sinai, and um, that will be reflected in all the work that we do at Mount Sinai uh, St. Luke's. And here is, uh, here is what it's going to look like over the next year as we continue the renovation. You can see that the ambulatory space is, is going to be beautiful with new cardiovascular institute, new infusion space. It's going to be terrific. Same at Mount Sinai West under the leadership of Evan uh, Fladow, opening up new practices, uh, building cardiology, orthopedics, uh, neurosurgery, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that, these are not rendering, so this is what the space looks like now. You can see uh, all the progress we're making at Mount Sinai West and Mount Sinai uh, downtown Union Square. Again, the concept is one Mount Sinai throughout Manhattan and now into the other boroughs. Same quality of care wherever you see a Mount Sinai doctor. And th these are some of the 2018 projects that will be happening at Mount Sinai West as it relates to Mount Sinai doctors. And ma further rendering of Mount Sinai downtown, which includes Mount Sinai Chelsea, where we uh, have established and growing a women's health center. Uh, as, uh, and also we are opening up on the bottom left here, within a few days, a Union Square urgent care center. Financially, uh, we're strong, but we've got to stay vigilant. Uh, you know, medical schools don't make money. Uh, it's always the goal is to break even and continue to enhance uh, through that process and growing the research, renovating space, recruiting uh, faculty. And Steve Harvey has done a spectacular job as the uh, CFO. You know, in most places when the CFO knocks on your door, it's not a happy uh, occasion. But Steve has a way of... Um, you know, giving the news, encouraging, uh, giving advice on how to move things forward in a way that I've, it's best than I've ever seen in terms of a CFO. So we ha we've outlined the challenges to continue uh, uh, to be robust financially. You could have a lot of great ideas, but if you don't have the money to carry them out, it's not going to work. And so we have a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, we're going to meet them to be to continue to be financially strong. I'm not going to go through this list. Our chairs know about it, uh, and it'll be available on the website. Part of the, plan, the action plan is to commercialize Mount Sinai Science. You know, so the Semaphore is an example. It's already a pretty big company. We own it. So as, as that company is successful and grows in value, that's good for the financial health of the school. Okay, so let me get to the uh, strategic plan. And this was uh, a very exciting process that went from November 2015 to 2016 in the first phase. And we are now in phase two, which is raising money and, and uh, at the same time implementing uh, the plan. And I want to acknowledge uh, Eric Nestler. Maybe, Eric, you can stand up. Our, our Dean for Academic and Scientific Affairs. <laughs> who... Uh, you know, played a major role in leading and developing uh, this plan. And it involved 37, it was, it was a massive undertaking. It involved 37 work groups, over 200 in our faculty, so we were getting advice from many different faculty. And at the same, t literally uh, almost at the same time, once we got plans from our work groups, we brought in 37 external advisory groups uh, from of world experts to say, look at this plan. Is, is this a forward-looking plan? Uh, is this going to break new ground? Is this going to 
have us at the very cut, cutting edge of biomedical science. So we got very good advice from the best people. And then we got, we collated that, the plans, the advice, uh, and had a, a strategic plan council, and then ultimately uh, the leadership had to make some decisions. So the characteristics of a good plan is one is you don't make everybody happy, uh, and two, you anticipate what's not so obvious of where science and medical care is going. If it's obvious, you're gonna have a plan like everybody else's. But if it's a great plan, you're anticipating the science and investing in that science so uh, we really make a difference. And I think we have a plan that is, is going to do, uh, do that. These are the guiding principles of our plan. To take advantage of the size and excellence of the Mount Sinai health system, which is now one of the largest health systems in the nation to establish unrivaled excellence in medical and graduate education. If you don't have great students, it's hard to recruit great faculty. And once your students graduate and they're the best, you want to keep them. And so that's why it's very important to provide the best education and recruit the best students. And as I mentioned, to anticipate and fund new areas of research that will result in discovery of novel approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of the most serious diseases that we face to invest further in er current areas of uh, excellence and be a power, to power an engine of discovery, to create more intellectual property, more collaborations with industry, and more Mount Sinai companies. So that, that is the principles that guided the development of this plan. So this is what we're gonna do. In terms of it, taking advantage of the health system, we have, or we'll be establishing several new research institutes, an addiction institute at Mount Sinai to be led by Yasmin Hurd, one of the leading addiction scientists in the world. I think it's all clear to, to us why that's now become even more important with the opiate crisis. Adolescent Health Research Institute that builds on the incredible leadership of Angela Diaz. An Exposome Institute that is taking advantage of the new science led by Bob Wright and his, uh, and his team on the role of the environment in human disease, particularly with children, to enhance transformative uh, clinical trials under the leadership of Anatine Alliance, and to fund and, and uh, build a Women's Health Research Institute under the leadership of Liz Howell. We're gonna expand the scope of research in the areas listed on the slide. We're gonna invest in surgical and rehabilitation innovation. And we created a new academic department of health system design and global health under the leadership of Pramjat Singh. And very important, very exciting, we've established an institute for next generation healthcare under the leadership of Joel Dudley, who's getting an indicted chair today. So th this is an example of uh, to come up with ideas that aren't so obvious. So if you're gonna have an institute for next generation healthcare, how do you know what the next generation is? And that's Joel's job, to figure that out. <laughs> As I mentioned, we're gonna invest very much in medical education, particularly in the Institute for Medical Education and the Center for Learning and Development. We really need to enhance scholarships for our students. The, the debt that our students are, are faced with upon graduation is really too much and we need to enhance the space uh, where, where we teach. That's medical education, similarly in uh, graduate education, uh, we've uh, undertaken a curriculum uh, reform. We're making uh, major investments in precision medicine. And that, that's an approach to utilize genomics, uh, phenotype, meaning the, the symptoms associated with human disease, to help predict it, prevent, and treat human disease using advances in biomedical science. We, we're gonna make a major investment in precision medicine. And we're poised to do that because of the size of our health system and uh, the electronic medical record which uh, Kumar Chitani is taking a lead in establishing throughout our health system. It will transform healthcare delivery and we gotta be at the cutting edge of doing that. 
And this is what precision medicine does. It takes genetic vulnerabilities that we measure, medical history, laboratory tests, environmental science, which I've already mentioned, life history, use big data analytics, which means we've had to invest in uh, computer science and high performance computing capability. And ultimately, and that's the goal, to tailor treatments and cures for our patients and, and prevent disease. So we're gonna invest hundreds of millions of dollars in precision medicine. And precision medicine touches almost every part of, of the human condition in terms of disease. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, infectious disease, brain disorders, childhood illness, and, and others. This is just an example. It's at the core of making progress. And related to that is we're gonna make a major investment in immunology. Um, the immunologists tell me that every disease is related to uh, your immune system, and I've almost become convinced. I have become convinced that we have to make major investments there, and Miriam Murad is the new leader of our immunology institute, and uh, we're very confident in her leadership. We're gonna further uh, invest in our infrastructure to make drug discovery easily, more easily done, whether it's related to neurotherapeutics, immunotherapeutics, using the latest techniques like gene editing, which I'm sure many of you have heard about in terms of uh, editing a gene in the human embryo uh, related to a, car a congenital cardiovascular disease. We want to be on the cutting edge. That if, if unfortunately, th there's a, an embryo or even a child with a disease, a single gene disease, where you could edit out that, dis that gene, is, which will cause death, uh, that can change the lives of so many people, and we need to be at the cutting edge of developing those techniques. I mentioned the accelerator program to invest in science that uh, need more money, and we're going to further uh, invest in other areas of excellence that is listed on this slide. So this will cost some money. Uh, and uh, we have to recruit new faculty. And the size of this plan is about the, the same size of the plan we developed back in 2006 and 2007, 10 years ago. And it turned out to be very successful. So we, we need to recruit uh, discovery science, investigators, translational scientists, physician scientists, and computational scientists. And as I mentioned before, you know, we need to do this, we need more space because um, we're number you know, three in the country in research dollars per square foot. We're running out of space, so we do need a new research building, and that is part of the strategic plan uh, going forward. We're, in, we're ac ac actively uh, beginning to think through what needs to be in that new research uh, building. And we do know where it could go because we own space uh, just north of the most recently built research building uh, the Hess Center for Science and Medicine. So most importantly, the goal of this plan, we're going to be successful, and this is what we're going to hold ourselves to, is that we make discoveries that make Mount Sinai Health System the nation's best and improve the lives of our patients both locally and around the world. Just want to remind folks that uh, we've initiated a very successful annual conference called Sinai Innovations where people come from around New York and some from around the world. This year's focus is uh, cancer, to talk about you know, how do we make progress in cancer, both at Mount Sinai and around the country. So here's our motto. It's for you for life. Thank you very much. So now, um, I want to pay a very special tribute to uh, Dr. Bernard Cohen. And this is something that, uh, at least in my time as a dean, but Nathan, maybe you did this when you were dean, um, to, to pay tribute to somebody who's, who's been a very special uh, faculty member uh, over many years, and that's Dr. Bernard Cohen. I want to read something about his career. It's been a remarkable life and career of Bernard Cohn. 
Dr. Cohen's relationship to Mount Sinai spans six decades, beginning in 1954, when he was a rotating intern at Mount Sinai Hospital, returning six years later as an assistant attending neurologist. He was a most, among the first faculty appointed to the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai when the school opened in 1968. Dr. Cohen devoted his career to studying the vestibular control of natural movement in animals and humans, and this is unbelievable, was continuously funded by the National Institutes of Health and NASA from 1962 until he closed his laboratory last year. That's 54 years of nonstop funding. I think that's actually the record at NIH. I'm going to say that again. I mean, 54 years, it's like impossible. But he did it. His insights into the physiological basis of the relationship between the vestibular system and the control of eye movement are legendary. He collaborated with NASA and the Russian space program to study the effects of microgravity on vestibular reflexes, twice taking his laboratory to Moscow to fly monkeys in space. He also oversaw the launch of the first human centrifuge into space by NASA, testing astronauts' reactions to linear acceleration and microgravity. In addition, more recently, Dr. Cohen's discovery that velocity storage integrator underlies the cause of motion sickness led to the first successful cure for a disease called Mal de Brachmann syndrome, a condition marked by continuous rocking, swaying, and bobbing after sea voyages. Dr. Cohen complemented his research with a busy clinical practice focused on the causes and treatment of vertigo. He's been an active educator, served as vice chair of the Department of Neurology. With publications approaching 300, his contributions to the physiology of eye movements and their neural substrate are considered to be among the most out outstanding in the world literature. For 40 years, Dr. Cohen occupied the Dr. Morris Bender Professor of Neurology Endowed Chair. And you'll hear from Dr. Vickery that we are now awarding that chair to another investigator. He was named after his mentor and colleague, a renowned chair of neurology at Mount Sinai. Dr. Cohen has graciously endorsed the in installation of Dr. Joanna Jen into that chair at today's ceremony. Tenacious, pioneering, vigorous, enthusiastic, sophisticated. These are the terms that have been used to describe Dr. Cohen and his work. We thank him for his lifelong commitment to Mount Sinai, and we honor his extraordinary scientific, educational, and clinical contributions. Please join me in a heartfelt round of applause for Dr. Bernard Cohen. I'm going to talk and then I'll take the picture. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dean Charney. Uh, and thanks to the many friends and colleagues that have come to uh, this very lovely ceremony. Uh, actually, uh, over the course of my career, <clears throat> I've seen a great deal of Mount Sinai history. Mount Sinai, which started as a Jewish hospital in 1852, had moved uptown, and at the time that I came, it was, an, it was a renowned institution in the world already with very fine clinicians and researchers. <clears throat> in 1966, the medical school started, and uh, <clears throat> from, that, from that point on, uh, we then pushed forward. And one of the things that was so striking about it was that 
the physician researchers uh, who had been at Mount Sinai made many important discoveries uh, that, that amplified and helped medical science go forward. For example, blood transfusion was started here uh, at Mount Sinai uh, back around the time of World War I. And Bernard Sachs, uh, the first chair of neurology, uh, was, the, uh, was the first uh, to write about a, an Ashkenazi Jewish children's disease, Tay-Sachs disease, uh, which later uh, proved to be very important in genetic understanding. Uh, also, uh, Crone and Ginsberg uh, described ulcerative colitis for the first time, another Mount, Mount Sinai uh, tradition, and we recently have found the first cure for a, a syndrome that is now very, very prevalent, uh, known as the, the Mal de Debarquement syndrome, uh, which occurs mainly in women, but in some men, uh, when they get off a cruise ship. And cruises now are very popular, and these patients with Mal de Debarquement syndrome also are quite popular. Uh, one of our, uh, one of our, our, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Mingjia Dai, who is here in the auditorium. Uh, Dai, would you stand? He's here. Anyhow, he, dis he, discovered, he discovered the cure uh, for the mal de Barkman syndrome, and it came out of our research that had gone on for many years. Uh, I also, by the way, would like to acknowledge the fact that I'm standing here in good health, uh, not, because, not because I haven't had any illnesses, but because I'm now in the 31st year after suffering malignant uh, breast cancer uh, and having been treated and, and uh, succored by, uh, and, and nurtured by Dr. James Holland, one of our remarkable uh, oncologists, fortunately, Dr. Holland is here, and I would like to, I would like to, express my gratitude to him for his long, his long-standing care of me. We began to study the vestibular system, in, when I returned in 1962 from Columbia, where I had done neurophysiology, and uh, had learned modern electronic techniques, mainly from Tektronix and some other. Uh, electronics manufacturers, and I coupled with a Japanese uh, otoneurologist, uh, Junichi Suzuki, who came from the University of Tokyo to work with Morris Bender, uh, my, uh, my mentor and first, uh, first chair. Uh, Junichi Suzuki was an expert at isolating the nerves of the individual semicircular canals. Uh, and I then knew how to stimulate those nerves. And we then began to stimulate and immediately produced extremely powerful eye movements. Uh, I would like to say, what is, the, what is the vestibular ocular reflex? The vestibular ocular reflex is something that, that evolved hundreds of millions of years ago and is present in all vertebrates and mammals and we have it as well. And it turns out that we really didn't know much about it. But then when we began to stimulate and look at, examine the eye movements of cats, dogs, rabbits, and monkeys, uh, we were then able to understand, understand the basics of that system. That led us to, in, that led us in about 10 years to understand with Theodore Rayfan, oh, a, a scientist, engineer from Brooklyn College, and now a distinguished professor, um, of what was referred to before as a velocity storage integrator. What is an integrator? An integrator can take an acceleration signal and integrate it and make it into a velocity signal, which turns out to be the currency of much of the activity that goes on in your in the back of your brain in the vestibular nuclei. Uh. I, 
I'd like to thank you for all the work that you have done. Um, I don't think everybody's going to understand all the fantastic science. I want to say two things, okay. more, if you don't mind. Okay. Following that, we then were able to discover, <laughs> we were able to discover that motion sickness, as you as you pointed out, uh, goes on, comes from this velocity storage integrator, and now with the mal de Debarkmont syndrome, we've treated over 400 people, uh, and. Uh, we're the only, essentially, the only place in the world that has successful treatment for it. Two things bother me. One, it bothers me that many of our, it bothers me that many of our students have enormous debt when they come to medical school, and we need physicians, physician scientists who are going to, who are going to push forward. The second thing is, uh, as referred to by uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, we need research money from the NIH, from NASA, uh, from, from the NSF to keep maintaining a, a, a steady state of, of research. Research on the brain is extraordinarily interesting, and our next step in vestibular research is to go into the cerebellum. And fortunately, uh, Dr. Vickery has recruited a wonderful a neuroscientist from UCLA, uh, Joanna Jen, who will come here and push our research into the cerebellum. I have to say I'm looking forward to it with great anticipation and excitement. and see why they're 54 years of ridiculous funding. <laughs> so our, as uh, Dr. Cohen alluded to, our first recipient is Dr. Joanna Jen, who will be the Morris Bender Professor of Neurology. Unfortunately, Dr. Jen was unable to attend today's ceremony, but we look forward to her joining us later this fall. Presenting Dr. Jen's citation is Dr. Barbara Vickery, our Chair of Neurology. Thank you. Dr. Cohen, the inaugural Bender Professor, developed, as you heard, a world-class program in neurootology. So it is enormously fitting that the second recipient is Joanna Jen, a neurologist with training in disorders of eye movement and the vestibular system, who has for two decades characterized their clinical, genetic, and physiological features. Morris Bender was a legendary department chair his approach was phenomenological. That is, look at the patient and describe the nitty-gritty details of the clinical signs. From there, localize precisely. And to further scientific knowledge in his day, he made models by lesioning the mammalian brain and correlating the lesions with changes in eye movements. When Joanna Jen gave the Bender Memorial Lecture in 2016, a faculty who knew him wrote to me, you invited another phenomenologist to lecture in the memory of the great mentor who was the epitome of the phenomenologist. What would Bender have thought to listen to Dr. Jen describe her study of a family having scoliosis and a lack of horizontal gaze? She then analyzed relatives and found deficits in the cerebellum and that these patients lack a gene for a brain midline crossing protein. We have gone from clinical phenomenology to genetic phenomenology. Hers was a scientific lecture based on an initial question that came from the bedside, the old Benderian tradition. I think he would have been happy, as I believe he would be today with the award of this chair to Dr. Joanna Jen. Our second recipient is Dr. Manish Arora, Edith J. Bowold, Professor of Environmental Health and Public Health. 
presenting to Dr. Aurora is Dr. Robert Wright, Chair of our Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health. Thank you. Manisha Aurora is changing the way we think about what causes disease. He's also changing what we think is possible and impossible about measuring our environment. His work stands out because he's going back in time, literally going back in time and reconstructing events from the past that led us to our state of health today. And he doesn't just go back a week or a month or a year, he goes back decades. He can figure out what happened to our mothers when they were pregnant or what happened to us when we were in elementary school. That's a key piece of the puzzle when figuring out what causes disease. We've known for years that adult diseases often have their environmental origins in childhood. The Achilles heel of this hypothesis has always been time travel. How do we figure out what happened to an 80-year-old with Alzheimer's disease when he was three years old? Those events happened in the 1930s. We used to think it was impossible, but Manisha's work using the developmental properties of teeth has shown us that there really is a way. For his research breakthroughs last year, he was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering. And now today, we're here to honor him with an endowed chair. I am truly honored to present Dr. Manish Farrar with the Edith J. Berwald Chair in the Department of Environmental Medicine. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright, uh, Dean Chani, and President Davis for introducing the session. Preparing for today, it was a great opportunity to look back in time and think of my journey to this point. And I have to admit that I realized that much of this honor belongs to the generosity and the efforts of others. My late mother, Mrs. Indra Arora, and my father who's sitting there, Mr. Arjun Arora, believed in me. They worked very hard to give me the education that I wanted. My wife, Catherine, and my triplet five-year-old daughters who are behaving unusually well, <laughs> Madeline, Kieran, and Grace, and my sisters, Neelima and Veena, thank you for sharing this journey with me. I also want to thank my former postdoctoral mentor, my current department chair, and my friend, Bob Wright. He has taught me many things, but most important of all those things that he has shown me how to succeed with decency and generosity. The privilege that I have experienced also extends to the people I have never met. The Edith J. Bearwall Chair was established by the Aaron family. Jane and Jack Aaron established this many years ago in honor of Jane's mother. Finally, a very quick word about Mount Sinai and what Mount Sinai means to me. It's such an honor and such a privilege to work at a world-class institution. And Dr. Chani described how well we do on so many metrics. But as an immigrant and as a son of immigrants, my proudest moment came a few months ago when I got an email from the leadership that I, my colleagues, and our students are safe and respected here, irrespective of our citizenship status. That is the Mount Sinai I'm so proud to belong to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manish. Our next recipient is Dr. Ann Bocock, Norman Orentreich Professor of Dermatology Research. Presenting to Dr. Bocock is Dr. Ramon Parsons, Professor and now the Director of the Tisch Cancer Institute. Dr. Parsons. Um, it is my distinct honor uh, to thank the Orentreich family uh, and Dr. Mark Lebwall and the Department of Dermatology for the tremendous gift of the Norman Orentreich MD Professor of Dermatology Research Endowed Chair. Dr. Ontrike is considered by many to be the father of modern cosmetic dermatologic surgery. He introduced hair transplantation and many other cosmetic procedures and was the first president of the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery. A leader in the field of genetics and psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis for more than 30 years, Ann Bocock, PhD, 
just joined Mount Sinai in August of 2017 as a professor with a joint primary appointments in the Department of Oncological Sciences and Dermatology and a secondary appointment in the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences. Dr. Bocock has identified a gene mutated in familial, uh, a familial form of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is CARD14 and determined the functional consequence of its, a psoriatic, uh, of its psoriasis causing mutations. This has provided important insights into how the disease develops and ways of combating its effects. Her lab was also the first to profile the psoriasis transcriptome and to use digital sequencing to identify the small RNAs operating in healthy and diseased skin. Her other research achievements include demonstrating the use of DNA markers in reconstructing human evolution and identifying proteins interacting with the early onset breast cancer gene BRCA1, such as BARD1, <clears throat> identifying novel mutations in the BARD1 gene itself, and more recently, identifying a gene commonly mutated in highly metastatic uv uveal melanoma, BAP1, and other gene mutations in this cancer, such as the splicing factor, SF3B1. Dr. Bokoff has received numerous awards in recognition of her research, including a psoriasis achievement award from the American Skin Association, and she's the mentor, inventor of uh, two patents and has published more than 240 scientific papers, books, and book chapters. Before joining Mount Sinai, Dr. Bocock served as professor and chair in the uh, cancer genomics at the National Heart and Lung Institute, Imperial College London, and previous appointments included uh, Washington University Medical Center in St. Louis, uh, where she served as joint director of the Division of Human Genetics and several research and academic positions at the University of Texas South Southwestern Medical Center. Um, uh, congratulations. Thank you very much, Ramon. Um, I'm honored to be named the um, Norman Orenreich MD Professor of Dermatological Research. This chair was established in 2014 through the generosity of the Orenreich Family Foundation to honor Dr. Orenreich and his legacy in science and medicine. Dr. Oren Dr. Norman Orenreich was one of the most famous dermatologists in the world. He took care of presidents and kings but what distinguished him from all others was that his office was open to any dermatologist who wanted to learn surgical procedures. He trained most of the famous dermatologic surgeons who are still practicing today, and he introduced num numerous surgical procedures to the United States, including hair transplantation and fillers, and was one of the earliest adopters of dermabrasion. He added science to everything he did and ultimately helped many thousands of patients himself and millions of patients through the dermatologists he taught. He founded the um, Norman, uh, the Orentreich Medical Group in New York, whose partners now include his children, David Orentreich, MD, and Catherine Orentreich, MD, sitting here, um, both board certified dermatologists. The Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai was fortunate to have Dr. Dr. David Orentreich as a trainee 30 years ago and he's been an outstanding dermatologic surgeon, a star teacher, and a stalwart supporter of the department ever since. The receipt of this professorship will allow me to continue to use state-of-the-art genetic and genomic approaches to try and understand the genetic basis of common inflammatory diseases such as psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, their effects on the cell and the body, and to use similar approaches to try and understand how genetic alterations in cancer cells lead to the formation of tumors and their metastases. I'll also use this knowledge to try and further treatments of these conditions. I'm extremely grateful for the chair that has been awarded to me, allowing me to carry out this research. Thank you. Our next recipient is Dr. Francis Cartwright, Edgar M. Coleman, Senior, Chair of the Department of Nursing of our health system. Will Dr. Cartwright please come forward? Francis Cartwright, PhD, 
is the very gifted chief, of, chief nursing officer and senior vice president of the Mount Sinai Health System, of the Mount Sinai Hospital in Mount Sinai, Queens. She has been a brilliant leader of Mount Sinai's oncological nursing and critical clinical services. In fact, we've never had anyone in oncological nursing with Dr. Cartwright's leadership skills or organizational excellence. She has done an exceptional job restructuring our nursing departments and to improve patient flow, support best practices, and align with value-based care coordination. In addition, she has shown her dedication to improving oncological care and nursing by publishing extensively in peer-reviewed journals and delivering presentations at conferences around the world. Among her research interests are symptom experiences of cancer patients and inf the informational needs of cancer survivors. I am very ha happy to honor Fran Cotwright with the Edmund Coleman Senior Chair of the Department of Nursing in recognition of her unprecedented and exceptional leadership. And I might add, we're going to be working both very closely together to make nursing a very integral part of the medical school. Congratulations. Thank you, Dean Charney. Dr. Davis and to Dr. Rich, who could not be here tonight, um, and members of the Coleman family, distinguished faculty, colleagues, family, and friends. I am honored and extremely grateful to receive the Edgar M. Coleman Senior Chair of the Department of Nursing today. Edgar Coleman Senior was devoted to Mount Sinai, and he was decades ahead of his time in championing and quality of care and patient experience. Mr. Coleman's special interest in promoting nursing excellence and academic advancement grew out of many decades as a trustee and has yielded two enduring legacies at Mount Sinai, the Coleman Institute for Patient Experience and this endowed chair of the Department of Nursing. It is through these gifts and their important symbolism that Mount Sinai continues to excel in academic nursing research and practice advancement. Through our strategic planning with Dr. Rich and Dean Charney, we have seen extraordinary success in recruiting leaders in nursing research, and we are poised to bring in major NIH-funded nursing researchers, <clears throat> thanks largely to the vision and passion of Edgar Coleman. As his beloved children, Susan and Edgar Jr., carry on this legacy, I am humbled by the, to be the recipient of this professorship. I would also like to acknowledge Lucy Derringer, her sister, who is here today. Thank you. Um, rest assured, please, that these gifts will pr improve patient care here for decades to come. I'm blessed by my career and my collaboration here at Mount Sinai Hospital, and I am forever grateful to have the opportunity to work with world-class nursing, interdisciplinary and supportive teams to create evidence-based, established exemplary <coughs> clinical practice, uh, translational approaches to symptom experience research, and to establish innovative educational platforms. I also want to acknowledge the support of my family, and I'll make a special note to my Peter, my husband, and to my daughter Maria, who are here today. Uh, thank you once again for this great honor. I'm also proud to present our next recipient to Dr. Joel Dudley, the Mount Sinai Professorship in Biomedical Data Science. Dr. Dudley, as I alluded to before, is the founding director of the school's Institute for Next Generation Healthcare. He is a star, both within and beyond Mount Sinai. He's enormously creative, an innovator, and leader who's using digital information to build better predictive models of disease, drug response, digital health, and wellness. At the core of his vision are omics, 
digital devices, and artificial intelligence, fields unknown only a short time ago, which he hopes to bring together to affect radical changes in how healthcare is delivered. As an institute director, Dr. Dudley is already making inroads to realizing this vision. He is forging connections in Silicon Valley. Mount Sinai is the Silicon Valley Medical School, or Silicon Valley is a Mount Sinai medical uh, area. He has access now to top data science talent and technologies, and he's bringing them to Mount Sinai. In, his, in New York, he's planning a next generation healthcare clinic. It will feature technology. In fact, it's already begun to operate. It will feature technology and care modeling, prototyping, clinical services, and innovative clinical trial. In 2014, the magazine Fast Company dubbed Dr. Dudley as one of the 100 most creative people in business. He's co-authored textbooks, many, um, many, many articles. And you know, one of the virtues of being a dean is you learn from our, your faculty, and I'm learning uh, from this guy. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. About the best compliment I've ever gotten in my life. That's uh, that was, thank you very much. Um, well, I'd first uh, like to, of course, thank the Mount Sinai uh, Board of Trustees for extending this uh, Mount Sinai uh, professorship. Uh, you know, it's a great honor and, and uh, responsibility to have you know the Mount Sinai name associated with your position, and I you know hope to live up to those high standards uh, that accompany that. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, you know, Dean Charney and, and, and Dr. Davis for placing a bet on me. As you might have uh, guessed, I was recruited from Silicon Valley. And of course, one of the greatest incentives that was offered to me to come to Mount Sinai was that I'd not have to wear a tie at events like this, <laughs> so, uh, which is a, is a huge fear you have when you, when you think about moving to New York from Silicon Valley. So I've been taking liberty to uh, cash in on that promise. Um, and you know, I'd also like to, to thank leadership here for creating an environment where someone like myself can succeed. Um, you know, I, th I think a, a lot of health systems, you know, or we can all agree that AI and data are sort of inevitably going to affect healthcare. And while most health systems are actually trying to resist this change as much as possible and hold on to the old ways of doing things, I've been welcomed in to Mount Sinai. We've totally restructured how we organize data, give access to data to people like myself. And Mount Sinai wants to be the disruptors, not the disrupted. Uh, briefly, I'd like to you know, thank um, Eric Schott for being the one who really uh, led a lot of my recruitment to Mount Sinai. I'd like to thank members of my lab in particular. I'd like to thank my administrative staff in my lab, who are crucially important to all the success that I've had here at Mount Sinai and, and, and broadly across Mount Sinai. And of course, I'd like to thank my family, Michelle and my wife and two kids, who couldn't be here today, who are my bedrock, and of course, uh, make sure I don't lose sight of what's really important in life. So, thank you. Our sixth recipient is Dr. Andrea Dunop, Lily and Henry M. Stratton Professor of Molecular Medicine. Presenting to Dr. Dunop is Dr. Barbara Murphy, our Chair of Medicine. It's my pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Lillian and Henry M. Stratton Professor of Molecular Medicine, Dr. Andrea Duneif. Dr. Duneif is a world-renowned expert in endocrinology and women's health. Her research into connection between polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes is truly groundbreaking and has prof profound implications for the treatment of our patients. Additionally, Dr. Duneif is the director of a National Institute of Health supported specialized center of research on sex differences, and leads an international effort to map the genes for PCOS. Dr. Deneuf has been continuously funded by the NIH as a, a, a primary investigator for nearly 35 years. She is the recipient of multiple awards and honors, including being elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. She is a member of numerous advisory and editorial boards and committees 
as well as being the former president of the Endocrine Society, the largest global organization for endocrinology. Dr. Deneuve actually began her career here and we're very fortunate to have recruited her back to Mount Sinai as the chief of the Hilda and J. Lester Gabrielov Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Bone Disease. In the short time since she's been here, she's already had a major impact on the division, revitalizing and re-engineering our commitment to, to the care of our patients with diabetes, as well as those suffering from endocrine disorders. Her energy and enthusiasm for this institution is why I am so pleased to award her with the Stratton Chair. Congratulations. Well, as Barbara mentioned, receiving this great honor from Mount Sinai has very special significance for me because this is where I started my academic career as an instructor in 1982. I left in 1991 to venture far and wide. I even went west of the Hudson. And returning here is very much like coming home. Mount Sinai's growth and success in those 25 years since I've been away is simply stunning testament to Dean Charney and Ken Davis. And a key factor in its success is the generosity of philanthropists like Dr. Henry Stratton and his wife Lillian, who endowed the chair that I have the honor of receiving. Dr. Stratton had his own distinguished career as a pioneer in the field of hematology and a founder of the medical publishing house, Brune and Stratton. Not only did he and his wife endow chairs in a variety of fields, but they also endowed the Lillian and Henry Stratton Hans Popper Department of Pathology and the Stratton Laboratory of Liver Diseases at Mount Sinai. In recognition of his many contributions, Dr. Stratton received an honorary uh, Doctor of Humane Letters from this School of Medicine. The support of the Lillian and Henry N. Stratton Professorship of Molecular Medicine will allow me to continue my research in the genetic causes of diabetes in women. Studies that began here at Mount Sinai. For me, the most gratifying part of being a physician scientist has been the impact my research has had on the care of my patients. And although we've accomplished a lot, recent advances in genetics and genomics, areas in which Mount Sinai excels, will permit us to find the causes of many forms of diabetes, not only those that differentially affect women. And those discoveries, as we heard in uh, the address tonight, will allow us to find new medications and uh, prevent and predict disease precision, uh, precision medicine. So in closing, I'm very touched that many of my mentors, colleagues, and dear friends are here today to help me celebrate. To those of you from my professional life, thank you for your academic support and scientific insights. To those of you from my personal life, thank you for keeping me sane. And in particular, I want to thank Nathan Case, who gave me my first job here when I was a completely untested young physician with academic aspirations. I can say absolutely that his early support and confidence in my abilities were essential for my future success. I have every confidence that together with the superb colleagues, exceptional resources, and support of the Lillian and Henry M. Stratton Professorship of Molecular Medicine, I can once again contribute to Mount Sinai's extraordinary and ongoing success. Thank you so much. Our seventh recipient is Dr. Emma Gutman. Sal and Clara Kess, Professor of Thermatology, presenting to Dr. Gutman is Dr. Mark, Mark Lebold, our Chair of Dermatology. Until today, <clears throat> I've been the proud holder of the Kess Professorship. Sal, Sal and Clara Kess were Holocaust survivors who came to this country and started a successful real estate company and then became major philanthropists. 
What, with my assuming the Waldman Chair, thanks to the generosity of Eric and Kimberly Waldman, I am delighted to pass the Kest Chair to Emma Gutman, and the Kest Berkowitz families who are in the audience are equally pleased. Emma's groundbreaking research places her among the most important physician scientists in the world. She has made paradigm-shifting observations on the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema. She created a molecular map, which was the basis for finding a new treatment that was introduced only a few months ago and has already improved the lives of many thousands of patients in the United States and worldwide. In the course of doing so, she identified a distinct population of T cells called Th22 cells, which make interleukin-22. She successfully tested the role of interleukin-22 in atopic dermatitis in a large NIH-funded clinical trial using an antibody to interleukin-22. For her work, the American Academy of Dermatology gave her, Dr. Gutman the prestigious 2011 Young Investigator Award. Dr. Gutman was only a resident six years ago, and she's had a meteoric rise to full professor. In that time, she has published over 100 major publications, including key articles in the New England Journal of Medicine and Nature Immunology. She is president-elect of the International Eczema Council and is on the scientific advisory board of major dermatology research organizations. She has been invited to give prestigious lectureships around the world, but what makes her most deserving of the Saal and Clara Kest professorship is that her work has improved the lives of millions of patients. Emma. So I want to thank Dr. Lebel for his kind words, and for those of you that do not know, I met Dr. Lebel for the first time as a resident in Israel in 2004. I did two residencies, one in Israel, and then I repeated the residency in the United States, and I was extremely ex impressed with Dr. Lebel. He gave a 45-minute lecture in Hebrew on psoriasis. <laughs> And I can tell you that his lecture was much better than my English at the time, so I was extremely impressed. Little did I know at that time that I would join Mount Sinai. I can tell you that as a woman and as a physician scientist and as a, an immigrant, I'm really, really thrilled to be part of the Mount Sinai community <coughs> and really, really proud. So I want to thank the Kess family and uh, the Mount Sinai Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Level, uh, Dr. Kenneth Davis, and Dean Charney for this opportunity and for picking me for this award. I really promise to do my very best to make you proud of giving me this honor. And I also wish to thank my family and my very dear husband that cannot be here today. He's in Japan uh, for his collaboration, love, and support over time. My entire family represented here by my dear daughter, Noah, for their support and love in the last few years when I wasn't much at home, <laughs> sometimes when I should have been. Um, and I want to thank, very importantly, for the people that did the work. My lab people that really did this amazing work, uh, my clinical uh, trial people that without them this would not have been uh, possible, and many, many other people that helped me in this uh, road and my mentees. Without you, this would not have been possible. I really want to make Mount Sinai uh, proud and to continue our really groundbreaking work on inflammatory skin diseases. I think we'll solve some other skin diseases like alopecia areata, vitiligo, and others. Thank you so much. Our next recipient is Dr. Helen Mayberg, the Mount Sinai Professor in Neurotherapeutics. Presenting to Dr. Mayberg is Dr. Eric Nessler, the head of the Friedman Brain Institute and Dean for Academic and Scientific Affairs. It is a tremendous pleasure to present Dr. Helen Mayberg with the Mount Sinai Chair in Neurotherapeutics. Dr. Mayberg and I have been close friends and colleagues for close to two decades, and throughout that entire time period, I have repeatedly tried to recruit her to our home institutions, and we finally succeeded. <laughs> so this is a very special day for all of us. Dr. Mayberg is a clinically trained neurologist. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. She was elected this year to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is internationally known for developing 
a highly novel approach to the treatment of severe depression, which we call deep brain stimulation. Importantly, this novel therapeutic approach is based on correcting nerve circuit abnormalities that her team has detected in patients' brain by the use of advanced brain imaging. Dr. Mayberg will be joining Mount Sinai as the founding director of a new center called Center for Advanced Circuit Therapeutics this January, the first of its kind in the country. And this center will be charged with integrating efforts across many departments and institutes at Mount Sinai, including neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, radiology, neuroscience, and others. Helen, we are delighted to welcome you to Mount Sinai. Well, I am just thrilled and humbled to be here with this group of people. I had a prepared statement. Um, Eric actually summarized my idea for the Center for Advanced Therapeutics, and I actually want to take the opportunity to just say, I want to actually quote from Joel, to be a disruptor and not the disrupted. And I think listening to Dr. Davis, to Dr. Charney, and to realize to be in this group here, this is my third endowed chair. And I left each one of them. Each one worked to enable me to do something new, to step outside the box. I was always charged with that in each previous life. Each one of those chairs allowed me to do exactly that, and I feel as though that is what I want to do here. And I feel like, unlike any other place I've been, I think we're going to be able to do something very, very different. And I'm extremely, extremely excited for the opportunity and I see this day as a real catalytic charge to doing that. And I hope to make you happy that you, you brought me here. I want to um, thank all of you for this amazing opportunity to mold something in a way to make up every mistake I ever saw in any other institution I have been in <laughs> and to try to do it better. I mean, I think you get to this age and you learn what you took from a place and what, when you get a mulligan, you get to kind of do it again and figure out how to do it better. And I want to thank my husband, Kevin, who's, who's here, who has tolerated these excursions around the country and, I, and, and welcome him to New York. It's coming back for me. I trained at Columbia in neurology, but um, a first time for him here. And, and we, we hope to join this amazing, amazing community. And thank you to the Board of Trustees to, um, to enabling me to do this with this chair. Thank you. You should know your husband thanked me for bringing him to New York. <laughs> <laughs> Our ninth recipient is Dr. James, James F. McKinsey, Mount Sinai Professor in Vascular Surgery. Presenting Dr. McKinsey's citation is Dr. Michael Marin, our Chair of Surgery. Congratulations to all you endowed chairs. It's really a remarkable accomplishment. But of course, congratulations to Dr. Cohen, although Dr. Charney is particularly invigorated by your 54 years of uh, consecutive um, grants. I'm more impressed by how you manhandled him in the corner there, something I've been, <laughs> I've been unsuccessful at doing for the past 15 years. Did you have 54 years of grants? <laughs> <laughs> Endowed professorships are one of the most significant institutional accomplishments for our academic leaders. We reserved this title not just for the best and brightest. We offered this distinction to those who serve Mount Sinai and its clinical and scientific goals above and beyond all other calls. Outstanding accomplishments, utmost respect from colleagues around the world, and unwavering loyalty to the Mount Sinai mission. 
that is the Mount Sinai Endowed Chair. And we've certainly heard that today from the people who have been introduced so far. Professor McKinsey is most deserving of this title, a product of sunny, now hurricane-prone Florida. He circled a good part of the country in pursuit of medical training and his specialty before settling in New York. His career in vascular surgery has been as much defined by his groundbreaking 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals, which have really set a course for a large part of vascular surgery, as they have been for his tutelage, which he's received from some of the field's most respected, distinguished innovators and leaders in surgery. Professor McKinsey has made a career in the treatment of patients with some of the most complex disorders of the aorta, the main artery of the human body. Working with teams of investigators, Dr. McKenzie helped chart a course that has led to one of the most important advancements in this field in the past 50 years, namely endovascular aortic surgery, an opportunity to fix the aorta without major operative intervention. This innovation, this innovation has made possible treatment of life-threatening and life-ending problems for patients who had very few, if any, options. As an educator, Professor McKinsey has trained more than 50 surgeons who've gone on to leadership positions around this country. His teaching style is legendary, resulting in Professor McKinsey receiving the highest honor from the National Association of Surgical Educators in 2012, and recently he earned the distinct title of Colonel from his beloved residents and fellows who awarded him the Jacobson Outstanding Mentor Award in 2017. As a leader, Professor McKinsey initiated the first fully functional vascular surgery division at the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, a small farm team to the north of us. <laughs> Before we were successful in recruiting him here a little over four years ago to begin a program of the similar ilk here at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai West, he has developed what has come to be known as one of the largest aortic surgery programs in the nation. Patients travel from around the globe to be treated by Dr. McKinsey and to receive treatments which they could not get any place else in the world. His work has enhanced the training programs of vascular surgery throughout the Mount Sinai Health System and has made our training programs one of the most popular in the nation. We are honored today to have Dr. McKinsey here today with his family, his wife Terry, his children JT, Laura, Jacob, and Sarah, and I want to conclude with a story that Jim relayed to me about his son, Jacob. Smile over there, Jacob. When he was a young boy. Jacob's teacher sent the children home one day uh, with the assignment to choose a future profession. Struggling with this life decision, Jacob looked at his very accomplished nurse leader mother and his equally accomplished surgeon father and asked the question, how did you decide what to do? Dr. McKinsey immediately replied, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you find a way to make a difference, a real difference, in the lives of others. Dr. McKinsey, please use this honor as an endowed chair to go on making a big difference in the lives of our patients here at Mount Sinai and around the world. I'm pleased to introduce you today the first Mount Sinai professor in vascular surgery, Dr. James Frederick McKinsey. Well, thank you and good afternoon. I promise I will be brief. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be recognized as the Mount Sinai Professor of Vascular Surgery. This rec recognition deeply moves me. I could not have accomplished it without significant mentoring and support from many people. I owe the, my deepest gratitude to my wonderful wife um, of 27 years tomorrow, Terry McKenzie. She's the mother of our four children, as already mentioned. Uh, and she has gone through thick and thin with me as we moved around in our career. Uh, she's come home um, to our house on fire after the birth of, birth of our fourth child, excuse me, um, and she's taken it all in stride. We've handled it together, and I'm forever in her gratitude. I'm forever grateful to her. Uh, can I express how much I love my wife? Thank you very much. <laughs> my kids have been great. They are successful. And they're, I'm very proud of them. JT, Laura, Jacob, Sarah's off, and the Big Ten, unfortunately, at Ohio State, pursuing her career in engineering. 
but they are good and they've understood when I was away at a meeting or operating and not there like a lot of the other dads. Mount Sinai has had a long history of aortic intervention and a high quality standard outcomes for the treatment of complex aortic disease. Standing on the shoulders of Drs. Jacobson, Ollier, and Marin, who are all innovators in the treatment of aortic disease, is a very daunting task. Drs. Marin, Ferries, Todd, and Plato's uh, conviction and passion uh, for the creation of the aortic center here convinced me to leave my position at Columbia and join the faculty at Mount Sinai. This is a decision I have never regretted. The entire vascular faculty on all campuses, as well as interactions with the professors of other campuses and other academic institutions within the city and state has been phenomenal, uh, and it's been truly a, a great experience for me. Our air program can't run without the support uh, of everyone on the team, specifically Helen Godardi, Ryan Rallott, and Lauren DeBach. I could not have done it without you, and thank you for being here today. Mount Sinai is an extremely enabling and supportive environment, and it's been a privilege to be here, and I think as we're moving forward, this endowed chair will allow us the opportunity to pursue fur in, uh, further interests we have in aortic pathology and innovative treatment of the aortic disease. We'll also go into the medical management and non-management, uh, or non-operative management of aortic disease, including genomics, and trying to predict those patients that may succumb to the ever <coughs> deadly courses of advanced aortic disease. Um, and there's continued support of, of Dr. Uh, Dean Charney and Dr. Ken Davis, who are building the most comprehensive and progressive multidisciplinary aortic program in the nation. This endowed professor perceptive and vascular surgery chair will enable, uh, the, it will uh, exemplifies their commitment to our program and will allow further expansion and innovation in the Mount Sinai aortic program. I'm honored to receive this chair and work to represent Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai to the highest standard. Thank you very much. I am proud to present our final recipient, Dr. Sean Morrison, the Ellen and Howard Katz Chair in Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. Today's installation of Dr. Sean Morrison as the Ellen and Howard Katz Chair in Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine marks also Dr. Morrison's appointment as the new chair of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. Dr. Morrison, an internationally renowned geriatrics and palliative care medicine physician, physician scientist, succeeds Dr. Al Su, who oversaw one of the nation's top programs, building a remarkable team of specialists who care for our aging population. We are deeply grateful to Dr. Su, who couldn't be with us today, for his leadership and look forward to his continuing involvement in the school and the health system. Dr. Morrison, as a member of the Mount Sinai community for 24 years, is an outstanding choice for the next chair. From his earliest days on the faculty, he has been an innovator in palliative care. He helped to start and ultimately became the research director and now director of the, what is known as the Lillian Benjamin Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute, the largest, most comprehensive academic palliative care program in the country, if not the world. He was also vice chair for the department for nine years and the founding director of its NIH-funded palliative care research center. In addition to congratulating Dr. Morrison, I want to thank Emeritus Trustee Ellen Katz and her husband, Howard Katz, for whom Dr. Morrison's chair is named, for their unwavering support of Mount Sinai. The Katz commitment to the field of geriatrics and palliative care and their remarkable generosity and energy to, and gifts to Mount Sinai over the years has had a profound impact on our ability to carry out our clinical research and academic mission. Thank you very much and congratulations to Dr. Morris. I truly am the last one, I promise. <laughs> um, 
I am incredibly honored to receive the Ellen and Howard Katz Chair in Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine and to be appointed to the chair as the chair of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. I want to extend my deepest appreciation to Ellen and Howard Katz, both for their generosity and for their long-standing and ongoing commitment to Mount Sinai and to geriatrics and palliative care. As Dean Charney said, Mount Sinai has been my professional home since I arrived here in 1993 as a geriatrics fellow. And I cannot imagine a more supportive, creative, and stimulating environment. Mount Sinai's culture truly is that of innovation and leadership. I would not have a specialty, nor a career, if not for Mount Sinai. It established the first academic department of geriatrics in the country and indeed in the world. It helped create and brought to scale the new specialty of palliative medicine in this country and is now transforming through the health system how we provide the highest value care to our patients and their families throughout New York and indeed as a model for the nation. Dean Charney, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of and contribute to that mission. I have been privileged to work in a department for, I gather, 23 years, um, where every single person, faculty, trainees, clinical staff, and administrators come to work every morning with the singular mission of improving the health of patients and their families. I cannot imagine working with a more dedicated and finer group of individuals. They truly make it a joy to come to work every single day. And it's the reason that I can never imagine going anywhere else. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for those in the audience. I suspect when you looked at the program, you never thought that M would be the last person standing. So thank you for staying with us. I am really, really looking forward to working with you in my new role in the future. Dr. Albert Sue. Al Sue has been my mentor, my friend, my collaborator since I finished my fellowship, and for the past 16 years, my boss. He's not here today because he's in Washington testifying to, for, his, for the Mount Sinai Hospital at Home Care Program, which was strongly recommended after his testimony for coverage under Medicare. It now goes to the secretary. Huge accomplishment. Al pers personifies the word leader and embodies what it means to be an academic physician. I cannot imagine a better gift to me our faculty, our patients, and our families, and the department um, that he, let me back up. I can't imagine a better gift than the department that he has left to all of us. My sole regret on accepting this position is that I no longer report to L. Finally, I want to acknowledge my patients and their families. They are the reason that I practice medicine, they are the reason that I do research, and I learn from them every single day. It's the problems that they face, the innumerable challenges they confront from their illnesses, and that the barriers that they must surmount in our health system that motivates and drives me. I am forever grateful for them for showing me the meaning of my work and for reminding me what a privilege it is to be a physician and a scientist. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Dean Charney. I think we all agree that we have an unbelievable new group up in Dow chairs at Mount Sinai. Let's give them a Thank you for your attention and this ends the meeting, the ceremony. Thank you.